All right, folks. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us for a behind the scenes look at the making of Great Bear Rainforest with director Ian McAllister. Ian, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and thanks for having me. Ah, absolutely. It is, a, it is an absolute pleasure. Uh, my name is Leah. I work at IMAX Victoria, the theater located inside the beautiful Royal BC Museum. Uh, we are not there right now. As you can see, we are streaming live uh, from our own homes as we socially distance. So thank you all for joining us from your homes as well. Um, what we're doing today, we just wanted to take a look at... Um, some great behind the scenes footage, go into some stories that Ian has about making Great Bear Rainforest. Um, that film, Great Bear Rainforest, is is a is a big deal. It's a, it's a big deal for British Columbia. Um, certainly our audiences here in Victoria and on Vancouver Island have loved the film. Um, what, Ian, what got you into to making the film to begin with? Can you give us just, just a really short origin story of how it came into being? Um, well, yeah, it's a quite a quite a long story, I guess, um, because I've been working on you know, wildlife conservation issues and environmental conservation on the BC coast for uh, quite a few years. Uh, and visual storytelling has always been a pretty important part of that. And uh, sort of always in the back of my mind that a giant screen film of the Great Bear Rainforest would be about one of the closest ways to you know truly appreciate the the grandeur uh, and the significance of of, uh, of our amazing coastline here. Um, so it was an idea that we've been kind of kicking around for a long time and, and, uh, and then more recently um, found the support to actually do it. And next thing I knew, um, I w we were off shooting and directing an IMAX film. There you go. Well, we uh, at IMAX Victoria had the pleasure of sort of um, facilitating some early screenings of footage that you had, sort of the raw stuff before it it all came together. Um, and so we've been sort of cheerleaders for this film from day one because we just knew how spectacular it was going to be. And the, the finished product definitely didn't disappoint. Um, it opened just over a year ago now. So it opened at our theater uh, February 15th last spring. Um, does that year feel like it's gone by really fast for you or it's so much has happened that it's taken forever? I know it's gone really, it's gone really fast. Uh, things have slowed down a little bit recently, but, um, um, but yeah, and thanks again for, you know, all of your support, you know, Victoria IMAX was, um, so instrumental in us, uh, making that film and, uh, it was super appreciated. Well, that's a that's a shout out to the fans in in Victoria, Vancouver Island, and Vancouver. Who, yeah, I mean, we we felt the love for that film day one as soon as we started talking about it. So, you know, thanks for everyone who came to the theater <laughs> and came to see it. So, Ian, what are you up to right now? Obviously, uh, the world has changed a little bit in the last couple of months, but what what have you been working on? Yeah, I mean, well, we we had hoped to um, really embark on some more ambitious film projects this spring. Um, and, you know, we've had to shift gears a little bit, especially because, you know, we really hope to have worked on um, uh, beginning a giant screen wild salmon film. Um, but that was going to take us into a number of countries. And of course, that all just got shut down. Right. So one thing we, we have taken advantage of, we've actually been out um, on the, the west coast of um, uh, offshore of Vancouver Island and the central coast. And uh, over the last uh, almost five weeks, um, just kind of got back into down in the city here uh, a few days ago. And uh, it was really just one of these once in a lifetime unprecedented opportunities to really document um, our coastline, really in the absence of humans, of shipping traffic and airplanes and jets and, and boats. And uh, it, it was amazing. You know, we, we were, we started out with the gray whale migration and, and, you know, it's hard to know, is this really so spectacular because there are so few people and boats out on the water um, because the water was crystal clear. You know, we could look right. 50 feet down and see gray whales feeding on the bottom. Uh, the humpback whales were coming in from their uh, winter grounds. Um, just these massive, massive rafts and flocks of migratory birds that you could see as, you know, to the, all the way to the horizon. Uh, and, and just again, you know, just all you could hear was, was wind and the, the blowing of whales. Uh, uh, and I, I just, can't, I didn't ever think that in my lifetime I would actually get, you know, to witness something like that. Yeah. Uh, on a 
our coastline, you know, just getting noisier and busier and busier. And, and so to have the opportunity to be able to see what our coast was like many years ago um, is quite, quite, quite rare. Yeah, it's, it's a bit strange. Um, I, I get that sentiment. I think that that's amazing. But it's a bit strange in my head because I already think of that region as being so remote, right? You know, I think of, um, you know, being up in the Great Bear Rainforest and there being so little going on already. But when you're describing it as, you know, there being other boats out there, being tankers, air traffic, you sort of forget about all of that noise um, that's happening that isn't a part of anything urban. It's just a part of sort of our in- industrialized coast a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, it's that. Thank you for sharing that. That's um, I'm jealous, A, uh, that you got to have that experience. Um, but thank you for sharing that. Um, we had the opportunity to go out to our annual pass holders um, and ask them if they had any questions for you. So I had a couple right away that I wanted to get into. Um, this came from our member Alana. Uh, Alana asks you, Ian, what inspired you to get into wildlife photography? Because before you got into film, you have you know long-standing award-winning photographer. So how did you get into that? Uh, well, I think film. Um, really just followed photography and, and just a different medium. So, you know, I've always been engaged in both. Um, but, but mostly it's because, you know, these places that we're documenting and these rare wildlife habitats are, are really hard to get to and, and very few people get an opportunity to see them firsthand. So, you know, our ability to capture visual imagery, footage, um, stories of these places is really an essential part of our, of our conservation uh, work and and you know we're visual creatures we respond viscerally to visual images um, so in many ways you know an image is it truly is worth a, a thousand words yeah <laughs> totally and when you're speaking there about sort of our work um, I'm assuming you're speaking about Pacific Wild the nonprofit organization that you're a co-founder of can you give everyone I know a lot of folks already know your work um, in the sort of activism and conf- conservation world um, but some folks might not know the details of what Pacific Wild gets up to so can you just give a super brief overview of who what uh, is Pacific Wild and, and what are you working towards yeah Pacific Wild we have an amazing team of uh, conservationists uh, um, working here in British Columbia uh, so we're, we're a nonprofit we mostly we mostly focus on wildlife conservation uh, sustainable fisheries protecting critical wildlife habitat uh, mainly focused on the BC coast, but our wildlife conservation and wildlife policy work um, takes us uh, across Western Canada. Right. Well, that makes total sense then. So you're up in these places, you know, doing the work and you want to make sure that it gets documented so that everyone can can get on board with the um, with falling in love with these places as, as they should. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So a follow-up to that is a question from uh, one of our pass holders, Alex, um, who wants to know if you have any advice for folks who are interested in getting into filmmaking, any advice for aspiring filmmakers? Well, the exciting thing today is that there's so many different platforms to showcase uh, film and photography. And so that's actually a really great thing. Um, mind you, there's, because there's so much, there's, it's a bit more of a distraction for people. Um, but I think the best advice is to, you know, really specialize at least at the beginning, in 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 a, in a special field in a niche. Become really good at one thing, whether it's wildlife or landscapes or interviews with people. Um, how you tell these stories, uh, do them really well. And once you become known for that, it makes it a lot easier to branch out into other things. Right. I think that's great advice. Um, last question before we sort of move on into a different phase of our interview here. Um, this is a question from a pass holder, Karina, who is nine years old. Um, Karina asks you, Ian, how do you know when to hit record on your camera? And which is an amazing <laughs> question. I would like to know as well. So please fill us in. <laughs> it's a great question. And uh, I have to admit, there's sometimes when I've been so excited about what I'm seeing and how it's going to look on the giant screen that I forgot to press the record button. Um, so I try, you try not to do that too often. That hurts to think about. Um, but, uh, you know, with digital technology that we have today, we have a lot more flexibility in pressing the record button. Um, we did shoot some film in the uh, IMAX film, 
And for each film cartridge, we only get three minutes. So you have to be really, really careful when you press record um, because you only get three minutes before you have to do a really elaborate um, changeover. So that's when you really want to think about when you hit that record button. You know, is this really going to be worthwhile or is something better going to happen in a few minutes? Uh, but I, I think it's, you know, mostly over experience that you um, begin to be a bit more discerning on when you press record, because it, it is a really important um, part of filmmaking, because you, you just can't film all the time. Right. That's one of the things that uh, Ian and I, for, for folks watching at home, were chatting about before we started the call was all of the footage that gets that got captured in the filmmaking process that then doesn't make it into the film um so it kind of i i was like oh that must have been so painful but now to hear that there was some stuff that didn't even manage to get captured i can't i can't imagine that's just like the uh the memory bank is just so full um Okay, so I wanted to uh, loop back to talking about your work with Pacific Wild because folks did have some questions just in general about um, the protection of the area of the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, I think, at least for me, the the film was really important in, um, you know, I already love and appreciate this this area and this this province and, and in general, you know, am super on board with making sure that we have environmental protections in place. But I think the film has played um, a really big role for helping people fall uh, deeper in love with our coast and understanding how uh, fragile and interconnected some of these ecosystems are. So I think it got folks really thinking about um, how can we make sure that we're protecting it fully, which I know is 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 likely, I'm making an assumption that that's likely um, one of your hopes that would happen with the film. So folks did have some questions about sort of the, the state of conservation. Um, so Dan, one of our pass holders, Dan asks, um, he says, first, let me say, Ian, that I admire your determination and perseverance in protecting our central coastal rainforest. Um, my question is, what is the state of wild salmon on the central coast? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the short answer is it's not good. We've, we've, we've been witnessing a steady decline in the health of our salmon stocks um, throughout the central and north coast. And it's at a crisis level. Um, you know, we, we know that just, you know, from the filming of uh, the Great Bear Rainforest film over the last number of years, you know, we had to struggle to find salmon in creeks sometimes. And, you know, I've only been really working in that area for about 30 years. And, you know, my short mem my memory over this short amount of time it was always that these creeks would be full, especially with chum salmon and pink salmon. You couldn't talk because the ravens would be so loud and the crows and the eagles and the seagulls. Um, and you go into some of these creeks today and they're dead quiet. They've become ghost runs. So um, salmon conservation is, is just a, a significant, significant uh, issue that we have to grapple with. And it's something that, uh, you know, we're really going to be more focused on in the coming months and years. Um, uh, at Pacific Wild, um, you know, especially bringing attention to the fact that the federal government is walking away from their responsibility to manage and steward wild salmon. You know, they're not investing in creek walkers. They're not funding people to actually go into these creeks to count fish. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of that information, we don't really understand the true health of, of wild salmon. Right. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great question that should be of, of huge concern for all British Columbians. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, and what sort of what what do we do besides informing ourselves and making sure that we know um, what the issues are and sort of what status they're at? What do we do um, as British Columbians to sort of support that mandate? Well, well, certainly encouraging the federal government to reinstate funding for monitoring and enforcement. Uh, that's a that's a key issue. You know, information is power, and we have to have, truly understand the health of wild salmon. So, getting funding back into the creek walking programs, the patrolling and monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we should get these open net cage salmon farms out of the water. They're clearly a major problem impacting wild salmon. Uh, we can do much better fisheries management, especially around mixed stock fisheries. We shouldn't be clear cut logging all of the habitat and spawning areas. There's a lot of things that we could do almost immediately to help protect wild salmon. Okay, so the 
I had a question pop up twice from two separate people and that sort of relates this conservation message uh, back to the film as well. And that is um, both DJ and Patricia asked, um, how do you feel about tourism and its relationship to the Great Bear Rainforest? And what role do you think the film has played um, in, in sort of potentially increasing tourism? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it's something that weighs, you know, heavily, certainly as a director of the film, um, you know, you're always balancing the need to, you know, show people these places so that they are inspired and they fall in love with it and hopefully will want to protect it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if people don't love these places, then they will be destroyed. And there's so many examples of that around the world. So it is a real balancing act. Um, I think we did a really I think we did the best job we could in terms of not, you know, sh you know, giving location names in the film, working really closely with local indigenous uh, people um, and, you know, telling the story of the coast through through their perspective. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because, you know, the First Nations were really supportive of this film because they have very active tourism programs. So, you know, Clem 2 and Harley Bay. Uh, well, Clem 2, for example, the largest employer now in the community uh, is tourism. It's wildlife-based tourism. And uh, Hartley Bay is it continues to employ more and more people locally and Bella Bella and many other First Nation communities on the coast. So it, it is a balance. Um, it, and unfortunately, there are many examples where too much tourism, too many people, too much unrestricted uh, human access, it does cause problems. So right. better management is the key, uh, limiting the amount of people ensuring that these are community-based uh, tourism operations. And then I think that a balance can be found. Right. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, the last question I have about um, your work in conservation with Pacific Wild before we, uh, we're going to jump into looking at some behind the scenes clips of the film um, that Ian and I will, will uh, digest afterwards. Um, but before we move into that, um, Darren had a question. He um, has heard and done some reading about the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement um, and potential failures against um, protecting endangered habitat and species. And he just wanted um, you to help us understand what is happening there um, and what, yeah, tell us more, please. <laughs> Yeah, it's a that's a big um, it's a big topic. Uh, it's a big coastline, and there's a, been a lot of agreements over the years that ostensibly have meant to protect the Great Bear Rainforest. Um, the problem with it is that you know we we weren't able to achieve um, adequate core protection, so just straight out protection of a large percentage of the rainforest. And instead, most people with the support of communities said, well. We'll just do ecosystem-based management logging practices outside of those core protected areas and everything will be fine. But unfortunately, as the years have gone on, uh, we realized that government and industry have not put resources into monitoring and enforcement and compliance. And so we don't actually know what ecosystem-based management means, if it's working, and if it's actually protecting the rainforest. And certainly in, in our observations and the documentation that we've been doing on the coast, uh, most of the logging that we're seeing, it's just kind of standard industrial clear-cut logging, uh, just as you would have seen 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so there are some real concerns about the, uh, the way logging is occurring um, in the Great Bear Rainforest right now. Is there information on that, um, Ian, that folks can learn more um, at Pacific Wild? Yeah, please visit our, our website, pacificwild.org. Um, we'll be posting more uh, information on this through our social media channels. Uh, and um, I'll be showing you up-to-date pictures of what some of the logging actually looks like. Great. Okay, so for folks that want to sort of continue their learning in that area, um, when this stream is over, of course, because you wouldn't leave it now, uh, head on over to Pacific Wild's website uh, and social media, and they should have more information for you there. Um, so I wanted to jump into... I, I mean, I've been working at IMAX Victoria with films like yours now for about three years, and each film comes with, um, you know, a, a supply of great sort of behind the scenes stuff. You guys have so much footage of the making of the film. I feel like you had an entire camera crew just to film you guys filming. Um, it's, um, it's amazing. We're so lucky to have it. So we have some clips for folks. Um, so that you can enjoy some of that as well. The first one we're gonna look at is taking a peek at 
um, filming underwater and some of the challenges that uh, Ian and the Great Bear Rainforest crew had um, on their boats and being out on the water. So we're going to make the jump over here to that clip. Uh, hang on for a second here, folks, and we will uh, we'll get that going. Just one sec. There's an incredible amount of life packed into a small amount of area here, and that's been certainly one of our goals is to, is to document as much of it as possible. That has meant a huge amount of time underwater, documenting the underwater world, the whales and salmon, and incredible biodiversity found in our reef systems here, and all of the incredible species that depend on life from this ocean. So much of the underwater world, so much of it has you know, never been documented before. Here we've got all of the working parts, a full team that able to film underwater and being able to do that at a moment's notice, spending a you know, considerable amount of time diving every day, especially in the cold winter months when uh, the water's so clear. The hard part is winter months bring the most challenging weather. A bit of a crazy night last night. We traveled through a blizzard and we woke up to three or four inches of snow on the deck. Give it another hour or two. It's gonna take some working. Oh, he's down there somewhere. Putting up with winter storms paid off as Ian and his crew were able to capture some stunning underwater images in the crystal clear water. But clear water in winter also means that it's very cold water. It's <laughs> cold water. <laughs> Stellar sea lions are a big part of the ocean environment in the Great Bear Rainforest. They're large, powerful swimmers that hunt salmon and herring. They're also very intelligent and curious animals. Oh, sea lion, oh my god. He knocked my mask off twice. He kept banging his nose into the camera dome. Not the GoPro camera right off. <laughs> He's a playful one. Even with my scooter, I couldn't get away from him. While underwater filming, it's impossible to tell what's happening above the surface. And winter storms can come sudden and fierce. You never know what's, what's going to happen. I was just scuba diving like one minute, and then I pop my head up and there's all these white caps. We just barely managed to get to the boat before the storm hit. We just had a pretty brutal um, last hour and a half of uh, storm force uh, winds, gusts over, getting close to 100 knots. and a few things, but we're still intact, still holding uh, an anchor, and I think we'll survive another day. <laughs> Wait, how windy is it? Ah, Yeah, we, we had a few different boats at cer for certain shoots, but um, we based most of the film was shot from the catamaran and, you know, tried to keep it at about five or six people, um, which is a very small amount of people considering we we're doing underwater, we were in the air, we we're doing top sides, we we're doing a lot of different types of filming from the boat. So everybody has to wear a lot of hats, um, but we, we managed to, we had an amazing crew, really great people to work with. And, and uh, yeah, we spent like, 400 days out uh, traveling around on that boat. It was pretty fun.
Yeah, it really varies. You know, we were sometimes diving at night, um, but you know, you're kind of switching from different seasons and, you know, we were filming herring every spring. We were filming salmon in the fall. We were filming whales in the summertime. We were diving in the winter time. So a lot of it's seasonal um, and a lot of it's, it's natural history. It's wildlife. You wake up in the morning and sometimes you think you're, you're supposed to do one thing and everything goes to the left. So um, a lot of it's just being there, documenting it and waiting for opportunities to film uh, the coast, yeah. It's so true, yeah, nothing scripted. If, you know, everything was wild in this film, so we kind of had to work around the vagaries of nature. There you go. It looks like um, I just had myself muted for the last uh, minute there, folks. Sorry about that. Um, that was to make sure you guys didn't hear me chatting over top of the um, stream. So I'm, I'm back. I'm here. I promise. Um, Ian, what, when you are out in those storms and the weather turns, I think residents of British Columbia will sort of know how volatile British Columbia weather can be up on the coast, especially the northern coast. Were there ever times that the weather got to the point where you were genuinely concerned that you would have to pack it in or that a shoot was not going to be possible or that you were in danger? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I think we, I forget how many, at least four or five uh, hurricane force events. Uh, and, if, and a couple of them uh, were the, some of the, well, there was one that was still the, the most wind of ever I've ever experienced, you know, it, it ripped the uh, entire forest down and toppled trees and cars. And, and uh, we were out on the herring grounds when it hit and uh, it was pretty, pretty touch and go. I was in my dry suit at the wheel of the boat with both engines full blast into it for a couple of hours and uh, just barely managed to get through it. So there's a, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of fun experience with, um, with storms and weather and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And what does it look like for you? Cause you're not exactly in a, you're not in a super populated area. So what, what does it look like to sort of hightail it? Is there an option or is it really just batten down the hatches and, and, and wait things out? Yeah. Sometimes you'd want to move into more protected areas, especially if we're working offshore. Um, but you, you have to be really self self-sufficient uh, because help is a long ways away. Right. Man, you are a, a braver person than I am. <laughs> um okay great so is there when i think about the film there's such a um there's such a balance drawn between uh connecting footage of you know the bears and the the wildlife on the coast versus what's going on in the water um did it take longer to film the water shoots or longer to film the sort of dry land stuff? Um, how did that sort of balance out for you and your crew? <laughs> um, yeah, everything took longer than we had thought, you Just know, even, even, uh, well, sometimes, you know, you design a shot list and you're like, well, these are the simple things. Like we have to get some really beautiful shots of, you know, an ancient temperate rainforest. And, that's only going to take one or two days because it's, you know, they're trees, they're not moving. We know where they are. Um, and then, so when we actually set up to do um, the forest shoot, it rained for like four days. And so we sat there and we could not film because of the lenses we were using. We could not film because of the rain. And so we're thinking, Oh geez, this is supposed to be the easiest shot of the entire film. Oh, <laughs> um, you know, and then some, some days everything happens like a miracle and, you know, and then weeks go by and it can be really challenging. So it's, 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 it's just very difficult to predict. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's awesome. I, again, patience is, is the main theme. I, um, I would be a terrible documentarian. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to jump into, uh, the next clip, which is about bears. Um, <laughs> as a major bear fan, I'm sure lots of folks who love the film are also bear fans. Um, this is sort of looking at how you, uh, the challenges that you faced in actually capturing the footage of bears. So we're going to jump over and I promise folks, I won't mess up my audio again. So we'll, we'll jump over there. Just, uh, just hang tight for a second.
Filming bears for our Great Bear Rainforest giant screen film was a huge challenge. Okay, we got him. He's right there, the spear bear. I can see him. One of the key sequences we knew we needed to capture was of spirit bears catching salmon. The challenge was to get the camera in new and unique positions to capture a fresh and interesting perspective on this behavior. We wanted the camera to have a bear's eye view. Because we're under the trees, it's really difficult to fly the drone in here and dangerous. But this cable dolly, we can run it between two trees and then we can fly the camera right up the creek. So we're going to try to do that while these bears are fishing up here and see if we can get a really uh, nice establishing shot of the creek and the falls with the bears on it. It took a lot of us to run this system, but it gave us some special shots. We also wanted to have more of a salmon's perspective on the bears fishing. So we placed our cameras half in and out of the water to see both above and below as they fished. How does it look? So we got a little bit of a uh, little bit of fog right in the middle as soon as it hit the water. Another important behavior that we knew we wanted to film was the bears catching salmon at waterfalls. This is a tricky and challenging location for the salmon, the bears, and our camera team. There's not a lot of real estate to place the cameras around these falls. Getting our cameras into the right position to capture this behavior pushed our team into some difficult positions. The results were worth the risks. Sometimes getting the camera into the right spot meant getting in the water and pushing the limit of what was possible. But the end result was a perspective on bears and their fishing that is impossible to beat. We had a very epic day today. One, two, three spirit bears all here playing around together. Maybe one of the best days of the month. Super happy. There we go. That uh, that last shot of the salmon going directly into that black bear's mouth is incredible. That is like, how many uh, waterfall black bear shots did you have to take before you got the ones of the bears actually succeeding? Uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time around waterfalls with bears and leaping salmon, yeah. and you know, uh, so yeah, we. It ended up being um, taking a lot of time because, you know, just to be and you know, and it's a really specialized camera. Uh, it's a thousand frames per second. Uh, so it's a highly specialized camera that, you know, is kind of bulky and hard to use to get that really slow motion. Um, so it was it was a, a challenging uh, shot to get. So I was really happy that uh, that worked out. Yeah, I, uh, I believe it. And so one of the one of the shots that I've always been really curious about, A, from the film, but then also seeing behind the scenes footage like this, Ian, is of you yourself in the water, um, in your dry suit, essentially on your belly. It was about halfway through that clip, on your belly, and a uh, black bear comes up and is, she, she either catches a fish or is just consuming a fish sort of right, it seems like right on top of you, like right there. In situations like that where... Um, <laughs> you or your crew were, were close to the bears. Is that sort of you guys being stationed and then the, the bears just sort of existing around you? Yeah, I mean, I was actually filming salmon in this pool and the bear just came lumbering out of the trees and grabs a fish right, right on top of me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, geez. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you don't want to unnecessarily um, disturb wildlife especially bears fishing but you know sometimes you're just sitting there and they just come walking by and you know these bears are are super fat and healthy and pretty tolerant of people and 
it's tough because some people are like, you know, you're, you're too close to the bears, but you know, these are, these are different bears than you get in the interior of, of BC or, right. or Western Canada. These are, you know, coastal bears that for one are, are fairly used to people, but mostly they have, because they have this predictable food supply uh, and there's this long, long history of between first nations and bears in these river valleys. Uh, there's been this long relationship between humans and bears. So uh, they're amazingly um, accommodating to us. Yeah. Right. They're like, okay, you're fine. You're d not any closer, but you're fine there. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, um, it's startling. I think it's a bit shocking to see uh, folks so close to these bears. And I know in that um, clip in particular, you sort of see at one point you yourself sort of like flinches back just a little bit like, Oh no, that's crossing the line. Um, in general, uh, you know, your film looks at sort of the whole ecosystem, but it does feature some sort of predators, um, bears being one of them, wolves, another sea lions, another, we saw that in the underwater clip. Um, how much preparation goes into preparing encounters with these predators? I mean, you've, you've just spoken a little bit to bears, um, but in general, how, like, what does the plan look like, or is there a plan sort of going in? To work with these animals yeah i mean i think it's based on you know certainly my knowledge over the last 30 years of, of doing um wildlife work on the coast and and working closely with first nation guides and and locals um so there's a lot of preparation for sure i mean you obviously want to uh, excuse me be in the right place at the right time to the best of your abilities and then then hope for the best um but uh, there there's no replacement for also just putting in you know a lot of days and and you know, because something always happens, whether it's weather or poor visibility in the water. Um, who, there's a million things that can happen to, to offset the best well laid out plans. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to quickly touch on some of the sort of the technical side of this as well, because um, that clip gives a really good idea of how some of those um, sort of really close shots, what look really close, how they're done sort of over the riverbeds. Did you guys have a sort of clear plan before you started filming on how shots like that were going to be captured? Or did you figure it out sort of as you went along, sort of saying, okay, we, this tech doesn't work for this, we need to do something different? Yeah, probably a combination of things. I mean, we were using technology that had never really been used before. We were using new cameras that were that had just come online. Uh, we were using uh, things that had never really been tested in these environments before. Um, and the reason we were excited about them is because, you know, like our overhead cable dolly systems is all remote controlled. It, it allowed us to put cameras in places that, you know, was completely quiet and we wouldn't disturb any wildlife. Um, so really, really amazing technology that got incorporated into this film. Um, and then some of it just didn't work at all. It seemed like a great idea, but, <laughs> you know, it just, the rain just killed it. So um, uh, it was a combination of things. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that BC rain will uh, do do you in every time. <laughs> I watched a um, it was like a behind the scenes clip a couple years ago. We had a film called uh, Amazon. Um, right, it was about the Amazon rainforest and um, uh, Mr. Bates, uh, who did oh my gosh, I'm I'm butchering this right now. But in their behind the scenes, they talked about how in the Amazon it's raining one second, you know, dry. At one point, you get all your camera stuff out, starts raining. I'm like, that sounds a lot like home. Um, so I think that you guys probably experienced yeah. a lot of the a lot of similar challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. The last clip that I wanted to take a look at uh, is the piece on um, the surf scoters that you did. So we're gonna jump over and take a peek at that. Um, Ian was very helpful, everybody, in letting me know that it's not pronounced scooters, which I have written in my notes in front of me <laughs> by email. It is not scooters. So if I mess that up as we go, uh, you have permission to laugh. Uh, are, uh, I'm not above being laughed at, so you go right ahead. <laughs> so let's uh, flip over to that clip here. Uh, just one second. Every year, millions of herring return to the Great Bear Rainforest to spawn. 
The result is a feast of herring eggs that attracts tens of thousands of surf scoters. The scoters dive down to eat herring eggs on the seabed, but this has never been captured on film before. Ian McAllister has been experimenting with new ways of filming underwater in the hopes of capturing this rare sight. All right, there we go. So obviously you got the shot that you wanted. How yeah. how did it feel to, to after three years of trying to capture uh, the scoters diving? How did it feel to actually capture it? I know it, it, felt, felt, it felt kind of weird because I thought, well, this is, you know, how hard can it be filming, you know, with there's 10,000 surf scoters out there. How hard can it be to film them, you know, eating herring eggs underwater? But it actually turned out to be a heck of a challenge. So I was, I was pretty happy on our last season to be able to um, capture that, that, that behavior. Yeah, absolutely. We had a um, chat a couple of weeks ago now with Tim Archer, who did the sound design for you for this film. And he actually spoke about this sequence as well with the Scoters being, again, particularly difficult because there's so many of them that to <laughs> capture an authentic mm. sound when you have you know hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands of them around um i think i more probably the max that we counted in one place was about ten thousand. man what does that sound like just to just to be around it's, them? Um, it's, it's spectacular they have one of the most beautiful um uh voices in the in the bird world and when you put that many together it's uh, it's it's like music. It really is very special. It's uh, they're 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 a, they're a really wonderful bird to watch. And how did you decide that you wanted them in the film? How did you decide that was a species you wanted to feature? Well, I think that you know the timing of these scoters. You know they're they're flying uh, from you know, you know from their winter grounds in the south, and and yet they've timed their migration to coincide perfectly with this very short window of of the herring spawn. And so, how you know the fact that, that thousands and thousands of these birds show up on the herring grounds, feast on herring eggs to get enough uh, food and nutrition in order to get to their northern nesting grounds, uh, it's really quite an incredible um, uh, uh, spectacle that has got the most elegant timing in, in terms of the migration. Um, and uh, yeah, so it just seemed that you know the combination that these are birds that have such a massive um, territory in terms of their migration. Um, but yet they're, they're also uh, amazing divers, so they can dive really deep and, and um, feed on these herring eggs. So um, this seemed to be, a, it would be a great sequence to have in the film, but it turned out to be a, yeah, a bit more of a challenge than I had at first thought. And to get all of those cameras out under the water, how, A, I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> how long does it take to sort of go through that process? And then are you doing it while the birds are there or... Like, are you sort of amongst the birds as you're setting it up? Well, the reason it was, cha <clears throat> the reason it was challenging is because um, when you have thousands of birds that are feasting on these rich, fatty eggs, um, they're also excreting a lot of oh, stuff. And, nice. the feather, and then you've got the, the herring milt and all the eggs. So you have, you know, that, you know, thousands of tons of herring and thousands of birds all making a real mess in the water. Oh, man. And uh, the visibility so often I go in the water and I can only see a couple of inches. Right. So I always had to get above them all in clear water and hope that, that they would come into it. And that was that was one of the real challenging parts of, uh, of that shoot. Well, that's real behind the scenes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Ian. That's awesome. That makes sense, though. Uh, it's uh, That would be a very particular challenge. Absolutely. Um. Okay, great. That's perfect. And what, 
I mean, the the film itself tells sort of the, this beautiful story, um, and which is the sort of accurate story of of our coast. Um, the main or in the story, the bear that is followed, Mox, um, we had a question about how you decided on that bear. Um, is it one bear or is it sort of a, a combination of bears put together? Um, and sort of why did you tell the story um, following Mox? Well, you know, again, this is a wildlife film. It's a, it's a natural history film. Uh, and it's in a, in a very wild environment and it was shot over a number of years. And so, you know, oftentimes you get back to an editing room and you realize that, you know, a real story is, is here, um, whereas you set out to, to do something different. And um, it just really made sense that, you know, we, we were able to follow one bear throughout um, uh, a few seasons. And, and um, so fortunately, um, you know, that bear kept showing up each year and so that worked out uh, worked out really well but you know you often don't you don't know what's going to end up um in a film like this at the end of the day it, you really have to you know work with your the best material and and there were big surprises you know we had that huge landslide that wiped out the salmon river unexpectedly um there were just so many things that happened along the way that really changed kind of the narrative and the direction of the film right all right. Well, I'm I'm conscious of everyone's time tonight. Uh, I wanted to wrap up with just a couple of thoughts from you, Ian. I want to know if you have a, or if you could share with us one of your many sort of favorite memories from making this film. Um, how long was the whole? How long were you shooting total, Ian? Yeah, we we had we had about two years, um, maybe two and a half years to to shoot it, and. Um, I was really fortunate to be able to squeeze in three herring seasons, but uh, pretty much two salmon seasons. So, uh, but I could have used a lot more time, that's for sure. Um, but uh, and, and the other challenging part is that you can't use footage from previous work because you know it, it's it's all shot for the giant screen, so it's specialized cameras, and you're really starting from scratch. And so you know to take so many decades of experience and then have to condense, you know, have to achieve it all within a couple of years was was um, uh, another another one of those challenges for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's lots of amazing uh, things that happened along the way. Uh, you know, there's this one one story. We actually um, did a behind the scenes book, um, work of the books, um, uh, put it out. And I know you've been selling it in your in your store. But if anyone wants to, you know, learn more about the stories behind the scenes of making the film, um, go to the work of the books or Pacific Wild, and you can you can um, order that book. Um, we had one day where, after a number of days of setting up, we had about 14 people in the field. It was a big shoot of um, filming the Kittisu Hey Hayes uh, grizzly bear researchers. And uh, just when we were ready to, to start filming, when the researchers were there, and we spent two days setting up, a grizzly bear just walked right onto the set and walked right, right in front of everyone. They were able to roll with the cameras and, and capture this amazing behavior. And it was the kind of thing that I had never, ever imagined would happen. I never even bothered scripting it, script it, scripting it at all because you know how could a grizzly bear end up there? And but it did. So you know, lots of things like that. Magical moments happened uh, along the way. It's been a absolutely uh, yeah. It was a super fun project to work on. That's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Um, we are going to leave everyone with a clip. Um, just a, a fun clip of uh, some West Coast wolves taking a selfie. Uh, Ian, do you want to set that up for us? What What are folks about to see? Um, yeah, that was that was a really fun, uh, well, fun a fun day. There's a pack of wolves um, that uh, I was I had a steady cam, so it's actually a big harness that you have on your back, and I was alone in the forest, wandering through with um, the IMAX camera. And, um, and I was soon joined by uh, a pack of wolves. And uh, so to be able to kind of film them in the forest uh, was super fun and they just kept following along. And I think they were pretty curious about me and what I was up to and this funny appendage uh, on my back. Um, but I um, got to this one point where I, um, I had a GoPro with me as well that was just sitting on the camera kind of for this behind the scenes stuff. And I, I think I, I put that down on the ground and one of the wolves you know, ran over and grabbed it and then, I, uh, I guess I was still rolling with my main camera, and uh, you know I, I realized you know <laughs> I really need that camera. It had some good footage on it, and so I started chasing the wolf through the forest and managed to I guess capture this shot. So yeah.
That's amazing. Well, we're going to close out with that clip, folks. But thank you so much, Ian, for joining us today uh, and for your incredible work on Great Bear Rainforest and the whole team that was a part of it. Um, And of course, as we said at the beginning, thank you everyone who came to watch it and will come to watch it in the future. Um, So thank you very much, Ian. And we will leave everyone with this clip. Thanks, Leah. I had just started recording on two cameras when these wolves showed up. One of them was very interested in my GoPro camera. This might be the first selfie by a wild wolf.